what's up everyone we're back with another episode of the dub Johnson podcast uh today i have a very special guest vincent edwards uh former purdue basketball player what's up vince how you doing how you doing man i'm doing good um so how you how have you been handling this whole pandemic situation as it has come in the middle of your season um it's it's been a rough one for me because obviously i mean for a lot of people a lot of people's lives you know i just kind of came to a halt but I think it's a, a blessing in disguise in itself because it's given us time to get closer with our family. I know for me, especially, I'm always gone. You know, I, I mean, thankfully, I ended up getting traded back to Canton. But uh, in the past, I've always been gone, whether it's college or any type of basketball. So for me to actually just be home, not have to go anywhere, or move anywhere, and just be able to sit and get closer with family and have family time, I think that's been the best thing that I, that I think I can take out of it. Um, obviously, with gyms getting shut down, you know, it's, it's hard to – do what you normally do, just like anybody with a normal job. So I think those are the challenges. But, um, you know, as stuff starts opening back up, we can start getting back into the flows of things. But it's just it's the safety of everybody first. So it's just kind of taking it day by day. Yeah, for sure. How much have you been um, training or hooping at all, if any? Um, I actually just started. I finally was able to get back into a, a small church gym to, uh, this past week, and it's been the first time I've really been able to like shoot on actual court since you know mm-hmm. since the season ended. I was shooting outside on the outside court for a little bit because I was I was just using what I could. But um, so that yeah. that answers that for you. I've been working out. Um, everybody knows you know Josh Bonita. He used to be a trainer at Purdue with us, and he was at Chicago mm-hmm. you know with the Bulls before that. So. It's cool because he kind of went in and invested, you know, and got a fitness app now. So I got on that program with him and, you know, my guy, JB, John Brinson. And we've uh, we've just been doing it together and they've been helping me stay fit. So I, I think a lot of people are sitting at home. You know, if you need workouts, you should definitely go check out the fitness app. It's called uh, Future, it's called Future. So it's a, it's a really good app to check out. All right. So what types of things have you been doing uh, through that app? I'm just working on everything. They give me, I have lower body days, I have core days. They give me some dumbbell circuits to work on, you know, shoulders, just everything you need. It's predicated, you know, they give you a little survey to take. Then it's predicated on how you fill out that survey. They assign you a coach and then you and your coach, they send you workouts on a daily basis. So for me, I go Monday through Saturday, or sorry, Tuesday through Saturday, then Sunday and Mondays are like my days off. So, um, and each day is different. Some days are running, conditioning. Some days are lower body. Some days are upper body. So, it's just been a little bit of everything. So, you kind of alluded to it. Um, you got traded to the Canton Charge, which is the affiliate of the Cleveland Cavaliers. Um, so, when you guys were – when did you find out that the season was going to be postponed or canceled? Like, were you we with the actually, team? Yeah, I was I was down in uh, with Kent, but we were actually in Chicago. We had just played Windy City, you know, Chicago Bulls G League squad, and we were supposed to go straight to New York. And at the time, New York was one of the biggest places for the COVID-19. So we were kind of stuck in Chicago trying to figure out our next move. They were still talking about flying in, but we just weren't going to leave to the day of the game. And, like, so we stayed. We stayed in Chicago for four days, an extra two days. And by that second, that fourth day, we just decided they had decided that the season was canceled. So we ended up just driving back to Canton. So we were kind of just sitting there waiting and just trying to find out what was going on. So is that the same day that, uh, like, the same time period where Rudy Gobert came out that he had to COVID nineteen? Was that like the same um, same time frame? I want to say. I want to say, yeah, it was. Well, it was around that. It was around that four-day stretch for sure, because that's when you know guys were starting to have to get checked out, and they were telling us we were going to have to get checked and things of that nature. So it was, it was in that four-day span for sure. Mm-hmm. And then, so uh, is the G League season canceled for sure? Like, even if the NBA think, comes back, I, I, I think if the NBA resumes, the G League will be canceled, and just because the simple fact that. We were honestly on our way to our playoffs uh, session anyway. Uh, we were on the last mm-hmm. end of the season, so I don't. I don't think the G League will be resuming, but I mean, I could be wrong. But from my standpoint, I don't see it. I I hope it does. I mean, that's good for us too. But I I don't see it resuming. Mm-hmm. And then what do you what do you think about the uh, NBA resuming? I heard Adam Silver said that within the next two to four weeks they'd have a bit of answer. I'm fine, thank you. Sorry. Yeah, no, I hear you. Um, I think, in my in my opinion, I just think it should be, uh, you know, safety of everyone first. Like, not even just the players, but like families, 
spectators and everybody. So I think, you know, they, they're going to figure out the best way to do it. And it's kind of hard to try to contain, you know, everyone and try to be, you know, the best way that you can be to help everybody's health. So I think they know what's important. I think that they'll you know, think the best way of it, try to find out the best outcome for everybody. And there's, I know there's a lot of players who wanted to resume, but they're also thinking the family of their, uh, you know, thinking of the safety of their family and their people and what's the best way to go about that. Mm -hmm. So I think it's one of those situations. And I applaud the NBA because we're always thinking about everybody, not just, you know, the players. Like, they're thinking about everyone in their family. So I, we wanted to resume, obviously, as players, but it's it's bigger than us, and we know that. So for us, it's just being patient. Yeah. I mean, you've seen – I don't know if you followed the, uh, the UFC. I'm a big MMA fan, so it's been nice to get uh, live sports in that, in that sense back. But I think the biggest issue, because you've seen um, athletes that are young, you guys are all in shape, in tremendous shape. Your immune systems are built up. So you guys won't be as affected as much. I think it's, um, it would impact the coaches more because a lot of the coaches are older individuals. I mean, I don't know about their, their health, but um, that and then, like, the, uh, the staff on the teams and the people that work inside the arenas that – uh, they'd be playing in because I saw that they'd either go to like Orlando or Arizona yeah. or Vegas and just have them all something like that but um, yeah I think I think it'll resume and something of that in the, of that nature but yeah mm -hmm. I think I definitely think that's a possibility or you know they'll go to the possibility of an outcome of no fans um, so it's kind of one yeah. of those situations and that that sucks as a player but I mean, it, it's our job. So, and I know if guys really want the season to resume, then they'll they'll end up, you know, going about it that way. But we, like I said, you want to do what's best for everybody. So they'll figure it out. They're starting to kind of try to get venues together, like you said, like somewhere in Florida, maybe Phoenix, maybe uh, Vegas. So they'll they'll figure it out. They got some of the best people, you know, to put the brands and operations together. Mm -hmm. For sure. So I wanted to talk about your transition from Purdue in the Big Ten to the, the NBA and the G League. What have been some of the biggest things that you've had to change personally about yourself? And then what are some things that I guess would – that have changed around you, like your surroundings, um, based on being at Purdue and playing in the Big Ten as opposed to in the G League and the NBA? Um, I would definitely say what changes the most is just uh, – just the people around you, you know, the atmosphere of it. It's just, it's so, it's a business. So it's much, so much more business aspect. Um, sometimes you, you get in organizations that treat you like family and that's the greatest thing about it, but it's, just, it's so business savvy that you have to be, you know, ready for anything because at any point of given time, like you don't know if you're betrayed it, you know, wave, whatever it may be. So mm -hmm. I just think every day that you step in or every day that you get to be a part of an organization, like you should be, uh, humbled and happy and you know proud of it because it, it's not given and you have to go out and earn everything so I would say like that that part of it is the part that you have to get used to is the business side of it but as far mm -hmm. as like as far as like me as an individual uh, I just felt like my transition wasn't too bad for me because me being you know the player that I am in my position and having that versatility it's allowed me to get opportunities uh, because of being able to guard multiple multiple positions or be able to stretch the floor, I kind of fit that modern day, you know, stretch four where it's really a three playing the four, but that's just kind of how the NBA is evolving. So I think that helps me. The more the NBA evolves like that, the more opportunities like guys like me get. But uh, that's just how I feel as an individual. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the things that, like, how how is your commitment level change from – because at Purdue, you obviously had to do classwork and you graduated from there. And then in the NBA, in the, in the G League, you don't really have many outside um, factors other than basketball. Yeah, I feel like you have to be dedicated. Um, it's so easy to get um, sidetracked. People would really think, like, in college, you, you don't have time to make your own schedule. It's like you look at a schedule, it's already mapped out for you. You got your tutors, you got to wake up and go to breakfast, you got classes. Then you got to go, you know, eat and before practice. So you have practice and then you go from practice. You know, you got weights either before or after. Then you go from weights to a tutor session. And then when you look up, your day is over. So I think one thing that people perceive is when you get to the league, you actually have more time on your hands than you can even think of because 
it's up to you most of the time to get in and get your work done, but you're getting up early and it's that practice two, three hours, maybe even just an hour, just depending on how the season's going because you play so many games. So it's up to you to, you know, get the extra work in. You're not going to have a coach or a trainer who would kind of just be like, yo, you need to come get extra work in. Like, they're, they're going to see how yeah. much you want it or how bad you want it. And if you don't want it that bad to do the work yourself, no one's going to say anything to you. You're just going to be cut and it's going to be next man up. So yeah. I think that's the thing that's perceived, you know, from people outside looking in is they think, oh, you, you don't have time in the NBA. Like, no, you have so much time in the NBA. That's how people, like, go back to school. They pick up different hobbies. You know, you see guys, like, just doing anything. Like, some guys like to rap. Some guys like to draw. Some guys like to do whatever it is. But that's why people start doing those things because – they start to pick up, you know, different habits because it's always basketball, basketball, basketball. But then there's days where you're like, man, I, I've trained. I've did everything I can do today, and I still have all this time on my hands. And you have to just find something to do or you'll just find yourself sitting around and not learning anything or not doing anything you want to do with your life. And when the game's up and you can't do basketball anymore, you're going to be like, well, what do I do now? Well, you have time to kind of think about that while you're yeah. actually in your years of playing. So. I think that's my advice I can give is like once you do get in a league and you and you make your niche or you know you get used to how things are going, you need to kind of see what else it is that you like to do. You get to figure out a lot about yourself, and that's one thing that I like about it since I've been you know playing professionally. What are some things that you've kind of picked up since you've been in the league? Uh, fishing. Fishing. You still there? Pick back up for me. Uh, yeah. yeah. Can hear me now. Is that better? Yeah, it was just it cut out for like fifteen or twenty seconds. So you said you said okay. you picked up fishing. Yeah, I, and I picked up fishing because I think it, it's good for your mental. When you're in the professional world, it's it's so much you have to think about and so much that you do and so much that comes out and kind of go and figure out what it is that you like to do. Like I was saying, so fishing is just it's a great thing to do. You know, whether you're going with a teammate or by yourself, it's just you're getting away from basketball. You're just out, you know, with nature, and you're just kind of just being able to relax. I think fishing is one thing that I really started to enjoy as I, you know, been out and playing. Mm-hmm. Um, what? Who are some players that you've kind of looked up to as like a uh, not not a father figure, like a bit a big brother, if you will. And I've kind of showed you the way since you've since you've been drafted. Um, I will say when I was first drafted to Houston, I mean, a lot of them were um, helping me out, uh, whether, they, you know, they were taking care of me, like, you know, me being a rookie or just coming in, like helping me save money or you know, not spend money. Like guys were taking me out to eat, just making sure, you know, showing me the ropes. And I thought that was pretty cool on their part. So a guy like every time we would go out on the road, you know, James would – personally take me to be like, yo, Rook, like you're trying to go eat, like what you want to do? And I just thought that was cool of him because like, here's a guy, you know, he's MVP, like one of the faces of the mm-hmm. league, like everybody knows him, but for him to just be genuine about that and just be like, yeah, like, hey, like, like let's go eat. Like I would text my brother, like, yo, like I'm really like sitting down and eating with James Hart, like this is <laughs> crazy. And, and yes. that was, that was just really cool for me. And then at the time, you know, I had guys like Melo who I would just be able to pick the brand and they would give me a little advice. Uh, CP, who's been really good to me, like, I can text CP to this day and he respond. And I just think that's really cool because, like, he doesn't owe me that, but that's just the type of guy he is. And I know CP gets a bad label from a lot of people. People don't think he's a good teammate, but I think he's so competitive that he's perceived as a bad teammate. Like, if you're not on his team, like, he's not he's not the guy to step on the court and be buddy-buddy with you, but off the court, he's a great guy. I got to spend a year with him in Houston, yeah. and he would invite me to his house with his family. And let me come over there and just spend time with them. And I uh, was being next to him in the locker room last year and just kind of picking his brain, asking him questions. So those are just guys, you know, that were in me last year trying to help me and just talking to me about anything. And 
giving me life lessons of life. You know, anything I can ask for, they were just there to fill me in. Mm -hmm. What's what's Mello like? Because I'm personally, I'm a Knicks fan, and mm -hmm. Mello kind of gets the bad rap for kind of the same thing that you talked about, Chris Paul being kind of being a bad teammate or being selfish. So, what's he like? Yeah, I like Melo. Man, he's he's honest. He's, he's real about it. He's never gonna you know sugarcoat anything. And one thing, and like he's always gonna take the blame. Like no matter what happened, like what people try to say about him or what they try to say about him in New York or even his situation with Houston in the beginning of last year, like he never you know never pointed the finger. Like he he'll tell you what was said to him or what was done, and that was it. And then he would take the blame for anything else that happened. Like I know in New York, I watched a. Um, interview and it's funny because Shump ended up coming to Houston but before that happened you know Melo was there before Shump came at the uh, end of the year Iman Shumpert he was just saying how Melo said it's not my job to take you know food off the table for another man he's like so he would always take the rep for anything and I thought that was just like big of him as a human being because he doesn't have to do that like here's yeah. a guy that's like he's taking all the heat like you know how crazy New York is with media and everything in that nature like he took he took it all. Like he didn't have to worry about it. He took everything that you know was coming through, whether it was like adversity or negativity or comments from the media. Or, you know, it was being crucified at times. Like people yeah. were hating him. He was getting booed at home. I think that's one thing that I was I like took from him was like no matter what, like he always took it on the shoulders. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I think I think people don't really see um, the human side of athletes, especially in basketball, kind of because um, the NBA kind of allows um, their players to show more emotion as opposed to football or especially baseball. So I think people just kind of have their preconceived notions about guys like Melo or CP. And I don't think they like, they don't um, hear enough about what they do behind the scenes with other players like you, like, I I didn't know that CP would and James Harden would take you out to eat and you could text CP any day you want and you guys were only there um, together for a short period of time. I yeah. just I think it speaks volumes to like how good of people they actually are. Yeah, and like Melo, I remember it was funny because I walked in and I texted my brother like, "Yo, like I'm talking to Melo, like I'm doing this." Like I went to the Bahamas with him at the beginning for like a little mini camp that CP had put together and. We were out in the Bahamas, and everybody seen that beach picture we took. And I had told Melo, like, man, I used to wear your shoes all the time in high school, like, everything. And he was like, oh, yeah. And the next day, he sits down and hands me, like, like four or five pairs of, of like, so I think that was, like, the coolest thing I took. Man, you know who they are. And people just don't see. Here's a, a rookie. You don't have to give him your shoes, but I've had like yeah. three or four pairs of player exclusives that don't sell. Like, and I, I personally got those from him, so I thought that was really cool. Yeah, that's super sick. Um, so, kind of going back to your time at Purdue, what do you think specifically at Purdue prepared you for the next level and having success in the league? Um, I would just say, uh, I mean, everywhere you go, you're going to face, you know, adversity and what you go through. Uh, I think Coach Painter did a good job of kind of just, you know, being real about the situations. And honestly, like, he's he's a pretty straightforward guy. So he, he never, you know, tried to feed you any false information. Uh, and he tried to um, instill that in you. So I think that's one thing I applaud him for is, like, he was always – Uh, whatever the situation was, and he would, you know, give his advice on it. So he was just a straightforward type guy. And I think getting that that bit or seeing a guy like that or a coach, you know, is just trying to be there for the players and, you know, trying to tell them what was best or think what's best. And you, you look at a guy like that, and that was, I think that was the best thing for me is to see that. Is that why you chose Purdue? Was it specifically Coach Painter and the coaching staff and the kind of the tradition of the most culture? comfortable there? Uh, yeah, I, I I felt most comfortable there when I visit. 
uh, I went on two unofficials, and then I went on the official, and I had committed on my official visit. But just I lost you a little bit. Yeah, it's kind. Of, it kind of cut out for a second. I yeah, think. no, I was just my bad. Oh, you're I'm good. Try to move. Yeah, it's a bad. It's a little bad area. I'll try to move out a little bit. But um, it was just. It was cool for me because, like I said, I was just close to family, and it was a. Uh, a better situation, better atmosphere for me to be there. And like I said, people, fans, spectators, like they always made me feel at home and, you know, made me feel a little like I was wanted. So I think that's what really made me happy. I was there now. He was there before I got there. He was my recruiter. And I, I liked, you know, liked him and liked with him and Coach Penner I had going. So that's what drew me closer to him. Mm-hmm. And you guys, your first class of you, PJ, Isaac, Dakota, I think Jaquil was part of your class too, right? Sure yeah, did. I mean, yeah, he was. I, I still count him a part of my art class, even though he's red shirt. Yeah. Been, yeah, with us. yeah. Um, you guys really established a winning culture at Purdue that was missing for since uh, Robbie Hummel and Joan Johnson, each one more left. This kind of uh, um, Purdue was in the bottom half of the Big Ten, and then right when you guys got there, we just shot up, and we've been, I mean, it basically catapulted uh, Purdue to the Elite Eight. I think that your recruiting class just created a, a culture again that, uh, just a winning culture again that wasn't there in the two or three years prior. Yeah, I just thought coming in, um, you know, Coach Painter's pitch coming in for us as a class was being that class that kind of helped turn things around. And so when we came in and we all kind of sat down and talked to each other and met and we were just like, you know, like this is what we're here to do. And we just wanted to put our best foot forward and do it. So we set goals as a class. Um, we wanted to reach the NCAA tournament every year. We achieved that. We wanted to win a Big Ten championship. We achieved that. And obviously we wanted to win more. But, you know, adversity happens, certain things happen and certain things doesn't go your way all the time. But I think that was our best thing for us as a class is, is Coach Painter kind of set that like you guys need to need to be that class. Like you guys come here like this should be you. And we had uh, good leadership, you know, with Ray Phil and um, we had good pieces. So, you know, Ray was kind of a guy that like was already there, experienced, you know, hasn't really been a part of it. And then, you know, came that year we we started doing better we just got better and better as the years went on you know with ray and aj they kind of helped lay that foundation and years came after that we just started adding pieces i mean we finally get a guy like you know mm -hmm. biggie who came in all american top 10 recruit <laughs> so that was cool and then you got carson who just obviously about everyone knows by now i was trying to tell people way back when it just he's a, a <laughs> score man he has an accurate score and uh, we just got better and better, you know. We had Klein, we had, you know, Green ended up giving us great minutes that year. Uh, we just, we had everything we needed, in my opinion. And that was that was a good thing about us. You know, even Matt Harms that, that year, my senior year, he came in and gave us great time when he was playing. So I just thought that was really mm -hmm. good. Yeah, I think, um, well, I was kind of, what the reason we got Carson was because, uh tell that his name is. CJ oh, Walker CJ. decommitted, yeah. right? Yeah, so he mm -hmm. decommitted. Yeah. So then uh, Payne yeah. got Carson, and it worked out well for us. Or you guys? Yeah, it worked out. I mean, it worked out great. Uh, and obviously, like, that goes another thing. Like, we don't – we probably never get Carson if that doesn't happen because that scholarship is open. So, you know, we get Carson and we get, you know, no gel, a six, seven point guard who comes in and he's just a big body and helps us. He, you know, he had some key moments his freshman year for us where I feel like he helped us win a couple of games. And people don't see it that way because he wasn't putting up 10 to 12 points a game. But he was a great defender, great athleticism. I know that when we played at Michigan, we won that game by two or three points. He had some key rebounds and key putbacks. Like it, he was big for us. So, like I said, you know, some things just blow your way. We, we're fortunate enough, you know, CJ was a great player, but he did commit to Carson steps in and we get Carson. And it, it, it was just... It was up from there. 
Mm -hmm. What was your relationship like with Biggie? Because you guys, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming you guys went out of that practice a lot, made each other better. So what, what's your, um, so what's your uh, relationship like now, both in, at Purdue and now? I mean, that's my guy, man. Uh, when he came in, he was kind of, if you know his background and know his backstory, he was just kind of that guy who was just a little standoffish because, of, you know, he didn't trust a lot of people or trust a lot of things because of what he's been through in his life. And it was good for me because when Biggie had committed, me and Biggie were at USA camp together, so I got to know him a little sooner personally before that. And then once he got to Purdue, we just kind of figured out we were like one and the same. We were just both super competitive. We would yeah. always just be together. We'd be whether it was playing a video game, we would argue. We play one on one. Like <laughs> neither of us liked to lose. So and we just kind of fed off of that off each other. We just grew closer and closer. We'd be on road games. We'd be playing two K together and Madden together. Like it was just always like that. And so that was just how our relationship grew. It was just two guys who wanted to be good, wanted to be great, and we knew we can go in the gym and push each other, and make each other better. Like it was good for me because I had to guard multiple positions. So. I would have to switch and guard somebody, you know, that was bigger than me or in his caliber. And then it was good for yeah. him because I was more of a perimeter oriented guy and I gave him different looks. So when we did switch one through five, you know, he can go out there and try to guard uh, a wing or, you know, a stretch forward, whatever that may be. So we just, we always enjoyed each other's company. And I think that's what, what's kept us close and still close to this day. Mm -hmm. And then how about Carson? How's, how has your guys' relationship been? Because he, he came in junior year, right? Yeah, he came in my junior year. And it, it was the same, man. And honestly, um, me and Carson, me, me, Biggie, and Carson, like, we were all close when we were together. And, you know, when Carson came in, me and Biggie just kind of, like, you know, took him in. And not to say, like, Carson, if you know Carson, he's his own guy, man. He's got his own swag as a person. So not to say, like, show him the ropes, but, like, just kind of be, you know, some some people he can lean on and give him some advice, when, you know, when he first came in and, we all just chill. We were all the same. Like everybody knows Carson knows he's super competitive as well. So we were, we were just in the gym with each other, you know, whether we were playing ones or playing shoot, like playing video games. We just, like I said, like kind of like me and Biggie, like we all just fed off each other's energy and fed off each other's competitiveness. And we all just took to each other a little bit better. And us three were just very close. Yeah. I feel like, um, obviously I don't, I don't see anything at other schools, but just being around guys like Nojo and Travion and Eric Hunter, it feels like the group that we have at Purdue right now is super close. And I feel like you guys are probably a big reason for that. Just showing the guys how, how to care for your fellow brother. Um, and I think that's gone a long way in Purdue's success as of recently, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's important. But, you know, sometimes you got to give credit to – well, majority of the time, you have to give credit to the coaches because they bring the right guys in the mm -hmm. locker room. Like, Coach Penner, that's one thing Coach Penner won't do. If you're not a guy that's good for the locker room, like, he don't care how good you are. You're like, you won't be there. So, I mean, that, that speaks volumes to, you know, the guys we brought in and who we brought in as recruits. And that was just best for, you know, Purdue basketball, representing not just on the court but off the court. So, obviously, we all gel it together as one and kind of just try to keep that family atmosphere going. And that, that's what's best for the team. You're never going to have a winning team or a championship team if you guys can't, you know, be together, do things together off the court. So we were always together off the court, no matter who it was. Like, you never seen one without the other, regardless of who it was on the team. Yeah. So we were always traveling in packs and just stayed as close as we could. Mm -hmm. For sure. So I wanted to get into this whole situation with no gel and harms, obviously transferring. Coach Painter had some – he appeared on the Dan Dockett show yesterday. And had some choice words. Um, I mean, I, I'm kind of, I have kind of mixed feelings about it. But uh, what were your thoughts about it? I mean, it's a, it's always a two side story to everything, honestly. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, people on the outside looking in, it's like, oh, he just ran away, or oh, it, it was, you know, he's scared, someone's gonna take his spot, or you know, whether it's people bashing him. Like, at the end of the day, it's like you're gonna do what's best for you, always. So. Mm -hmm. I'm never going to bash a guy. And not saying Coach Painter bash a guy. I'm just speaking, like, from people outside looking in. Like, yeah. you're never going to just destroy a kid because he thinks there's a part of the program or anything that's been done for them. I'm pretty sure he talked to those guys who are grateful for the time they spent out for Duke. Like, it's without a brainer. But if they 
feel like they owe it to themselves that there's a better opportunity than I feel like that's what they thought and that's what they took. And um, I feel like it shouldn't be, they shouldn't be getting bashed for it. Uh, and that's just my personal opinion. Like everybody, you know, is saying, because Coach Painter talked about the adversity and, and that's right. Like in life, you're going to have adversity. You're going to have to fight it. Like, but in my, like how I feel about it, like it's just, it's always a two side story. And that's just how I feel about the situation. Like, because you're always going to do, like I said, what's best for you. Like as Coach Painter wants to do what's best for Purdue, and to them, they feel like they're doing what's best for them. So that's just kind of a thin line right there. And me knowing yeah, like no Jill and and me getting to know Matt and no Joe personally, like and being teammates with them, I just feel like those are two guys who work and are smart kids, intelligent kids, and you know, do things on their own. And so that's just how they felt. They maybe might have felt uncomfortable, they might have felt like they weren't developing. Like I mean, you just you don't know unless you you, yeah. you these are people you talk to. And I and I know those guys, like they worked hard, like I know Nigel works hard. Like he's always posting videos, working on videos. Even though he's a guy who likes to have a lot of fun, like he's always working hard. So I feel like he's a guy who, no matter what, like he's not afraid to compete or afraid to do things in that nature. Like he's always going to mm-hmm. compete. And I think people are saying, or people are perceiving, like Nigel's not a guy who thinks he's this lottery pick, first round pick. Like he's confident in himself and he's confident in his game. But he's a guy. He's like. He doesn't think he made it. Like, he doesn't think anybody owes him anything. But he just, I think, in his opinion, he wants to put himself in the best situation. And if he feels like there's a better situation, then that's his choice. I mean, no, no joke personally. Like, he doesn't, he's a very humble kid. He works hard. He's never going to think he's better than what he is. Like I said, he's confident in himself, but he's never going to, you're never going to sit down and talk to him. He's going to be like, no, nah, I'm the best. I should have had this or I should have had that. He's going to be like, no, I just, I can work better. Like, that's always been his mentality. The same thing with Matt. Like, I would talk to Matt, and Matt, like, he, he hears he's going to want to do better. And obviously, you can never question, you know, Matt's energy or charisma because he's always showed it. He's always played with it. So, I, I have nothing but respect for those two guys. And obviously, like, as fans or as them stick it out and fight through it. But sometimes, you know, people take a different road and, like, how – you know, you're going to do what's best for Purdue. Like I said, they think that they're doing what's best for them. And, you know, people might not see it that way, but I just I just think everybody should just honestly see it on both ways. Like, mm-hmm. are, you, are you going to look at it differently if you have a better job offer or you have something that you think it, it fits you better? Like, are you going to criticize yourself the way you're criticizing these kids? Like, And I think that's what mm-hmm. people don't understand or people don't get. And I think that's – that's crazy to me is because it's like you're you're so quick to talk about this kid but i mean do we say that about a coach if a coach goes and takes a different job do we say he was scared to help turn a program around or like change the new culture like no like he felt like he did what was best for him and his family and these kids feel like they're doing what's best for them so you can't really say you know you really know for them because you don't unless you're behind those walls like you don't know so that's just kind of how i feel about it like I, I'm on both sides. Like I, I've been a guy who sat there and fought through adversity, and I, I've seen guys transfer. So that's just kind of my take on it. Like you are who you are, and don't let it define you. Just because people think you're afraid of adversity, like for Matt and Ojeda, like go and go and prove people wrong. Like go and show people like that, like that, like you made a good decision, or you know you you did what you wanted to do, and don't look back at it. Like in life, we only get one life, and you you have to every choice has a consequence behind it, but every choice you make, like make it and, and give it your all. And I think those guys would do that. Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, personally, I want nothing but the best for, for Harms and, and no gel. Cause I mean, they've, they spent three years here. They won a big 10 championship. I mean, they made an elite eight run last year or the, the previous year. I mean, they've done almost all they can um, for Purdue. And I just, I see a lot of people on social media, especially Twitter, bunch of just old dudes old dudes that are complaining about oh we don't need no joan harms anyway yeah like right it's crazy crazy that like how quick people can turn on you and that just goes Mm -hmm. to show you like like why like and and that's how it gets when you get to the nba like people get mad at people for wanting to go do what's best for them like why are you mad about it like if they feel like this is the best decision for them why can't it never just be a, hey, thanks for everything, and I wish you the best? Mm-hmm. And it just be that, and that's just not the way the world is ran. So, I 
mean, and it is what it is. Like, you're always going to have naysayers. You're always going to have people who support. And my opinion, like, I'm just like, hey, like, like, hey, you got a big career. You did what you, like, you did what you did or whatever. Whoever, whatever your side is, like, at the end of the day, it should be like, hey, man, like, thanks for your time at Purdue. Like, don't don't sit here and bash the kid now that he's gone because these are some of the same people who were sticking up for him when he was here and he was working his butt off or with or Matt when they were here and they were having great games for us. So just keep mm-hmm. that keep that same note, keep that same energy. Don't don't turn it into something different now because the kid left left the program. Like yeah. either you're gonna support or you're not. But that's just the world. Like some people some people are real about it, some people aren't. Yeah, I just don't I mean I, I I I agree with what you're saying. I just don't subscribe to the notion that people should hate on kids that transfer because you don't you don't know what the hell's going on in their head or their family or whatever, like what, what they want to do. They're doing what's best for them. They're 20, right. 23, no, just 21, 22. I mean, yeah. they're, they're kids. They don't know what they want yet. Um, mm-hmm. So they're just trying to figure things out. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's ridiculous. I, I'm not going to hate on anyone who transfers. It sucks to see people go because I didn't, I didn't want harms and no to transfer. And I think that a big part of it is – people um i think this this is my personal opinion on what happened with coach is he was upset that they left because he knew that they could contribute so he's kind of lashing out at it because he's like it's kind of like the jealous ex-girlfriend type of thing if you understand what i'm saying yeah i mean yeah i mean like you said like, I, it's always two sides of the story and he, and that's mm, and that is, he has a right to voice opinion, and then they have a right to voice their opinion. But we live in a world, you know, to watch what they say because if they say something, then it's gonna be like, see, 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 like we know, like that, see, that's why, that's why, like he doesn't know what he's talking. These are kids who who lived in that program, like it, that's just how they felt, and then there was some type of miscommunication, and that's just what it was. So I, I yeah. don't, I don't have any knock for either of the sides. Like he, Coach Painter has the right to to say what he wanted to say. Yeah. And, and you know, choose his choice of words, and you know, Joe's gonna have you know his side, and Matt or Matt's gonna have their side. So, I, I I'm and I'm neutral. I'm in the middle of it. Like, I yeah. see both ways. Like, I I understand it. I was I was the same way when Kendall left us. Like, that was a guy who I who I felt like would really help us. You know, the year the following year, but he just had an unfortunate accident where you know he had a friend who passed away, and it, it kind of messed him up. So, I, I've like I said, I've seen it happen to guys and I've seen guys go off and do good like Kendall went to Nevada they were you know tournament run like they were a good team they had a great team so and he's obviously doing well for himself right now playing you know professionally in Australia so you know I don't I, I don't see the bad in it like some people just yeah. think there's a better situation for them and mm-hmm. you know like I said coach Payne has the right to voice himself and and that's how he feels and you know that's that's what he stands by it and and so be it like everybody has their side to the story yeah for sure did you see uh, – it just happened, like, maybe 30 minutes ago, an hour ago, that no gel picked uh, Michigan? Yeah. I mean, of course, people are going to give him – he's going to get so much crap from Purdue fans. And, I mean, yeah, he picked – he picked the people. Yeah, and that's something he's going to have to deal with. And I'm pretty sure he knew that when he you know, made his choice. But, once again – that's maybe somewhere he thinks he'll be better at. Like you, you just yeah. mm-hmm. to him, like he had to sit down with you know his mom or for sure in his corner at all times. They talked about obviously you had to talk to some of these coaches for him to be able to make that decision. And if he feels like mm-hmm. you know Jawan Howard, Coach Howard's going to help him with the guy who's NBA champion, be you know, a college legend, can really help him develop his game, then that's his choice. Um, I mean, a lot of people aren't going to respect it, and, and a lot of people don't respect it. Just like when guys up and decide to go to go somewhere else in the NBA, like we're supposed to respect your guys' opinion or spectators' opinion when you don't respect when we do what's best for us or we feel what's best for us. Like mm-hmm. I feel like it should be a mutual respect on both sides, but it's never that way. Yeah, sure. Um, so I don't want to hold you too much longer. But we did see yesterday that the men of Mackey for the basketball tournament, their team, the first six guys on the team came out. Uh, what were your thoughts on that? Uh, I think it's a great opportunity. Um, I don't know uh, what's being able to play. Uh, 
as far as if they want to do it because it's obvious, like we were talking about the NBA, like yeah, the big unions, like the problem with the fans or whatever it may be. So, you know, sitting down, now they're going to play. I think that's incredible. I just, mm-hmm. I, I haven't made my decision about it yet. Uh, obviously, I have to the Mavs, but just um, kind of just seeing how things are going. And right now, I'm honestly just getting back on the court. So, so I'm just yeah. kind of taking it day by day. I haven't gave them, given a yes or no yet. So it's like in mm-hmm. that area right now. All right. All right, man. Um, but, I'm gonna yeah, let so, you go. I mean, it, it, it's been one of those uh, these last couple of days because I've, I've had people been hitting me up. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. I can. Okay. Well, you can keep you can keep going. I think I cut you off. Oh uh, yeah, no, you're fine. I was just saying I didn't know if you could hear me or not. I was just saying like these last couple of days have just been crazy with my phone because I've obviously been getting questions about that and then also you know people asking me my opinion about the guys transferring. I'm just like, at the end of the day, everybody's going to do what they feel is best for them. So uh, I, I don't have any bad blood for them. Like, I told guys when I left, and I, I text those guys every now and then, like, man, whatever you need, if you need to talk to me, you need anything, like, any, you want my opinion. Like, I probably talked to, before this happened, I probably talked to Nojo, like, last week. Like, like, whatever you do, like, I'm going to give you my honest opinion on it, and I'm going to tell you what I think, and then, you know, you take it, and you go do what you want to do with it. So, I'm, I'm not knocking any other guys for wanting to do what they felt was best. And at the end of the day, everybody's always going to do what they think is best for them. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, I have to get into specifics, but did Nojo allude that he wanted to transfer when you talked to him? Um, he was just or asking. Or was he thinking we just, about it? We were just talking about, you know, basketball in general. Like, we weren't really talking about him transferring. He was just asking me questions, you know, about the next level and, just wanted to know how things were and asking me about um, what I thought about his game this year. And I told him, you know, talking about areas that, like, I think he can improve and do the same things. And because guys like, guys like Nojo, he's a great kid. And he always looking to improve. That's why, like, people are mad for entering his name in the draft. So if you have a chance to get the answers to a test, why would <laughs> If you have a chance yeah. to go fulfill your dream, if someone came to you like, look, I'm going to show you this is a way you can make a million dollars, but you got to follow this step by step and go get that. Yeah, for sure. You, you're not going to go and take, like, you're not going to listen to what that person has to say. Like, that's just kind of how his approach was like that. And that's what he's doing. He's, he's going to grab information to help him be able to get to that next level or try to get to that next level. Or it's like, you know, you came with Matt. If that's what Matt chooses to do. And then, you know, like, that's just how been no joke. And it's just not on Matt. Like, it's just trying to get information to, you know, it's crazy, like, how people can just be on your side one time and then all of a sudden you make a decision that you think is best. If it's not to their liking, you're bashed. It's quick. It's like yeah. you, never, you were never even there. So that's that's just my opinion. Um, so like I said, I'm gonna let you go. Thank you so much for doing this, for taking the time. I really appreciate it, and uh, I wish you the best. I hope your family's um, staying safe. Thanks. I wish you the best too. All right. Salute. Okay.